Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the 2014 Candidates Forum. My name is Lynn Browning, and I'm with the Evergreen Area Chamber of Commerce. One of our valued core competencies is representing the business interests of government. Not only do we represent our business interests, but we are an unincorporated community. We take the role seriously for representing our community interests of government as well. We have some very fine candidates with us tonight who are going to share with you their platform. I would like to thank the Evergreen Fire and Rescue Department for allowing us to use their beautiful facilities. So a round of applause. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our publisher of Evergreen Newspapers, Tim Zeman, right up here in the corner. <laughs> in the audience tonight to cover our discussions, but at this time, I would like to draw attention to editor Doug Bell. Doug has been with Evergreen Newspapers for going on 10 years. So with that, I would like to present Doug Bell, one of our partners tonight. as a, a 
elected member of the Evergreen Park and Recreation District Board. I'm pretty much known there as the fiscal watchdog, making sure that we have a balanced budget and that our tax dollars are put to the highest and best use, providing excellent park and recreation services for all of you. I have 30 years of experience from working as a counselor with underprivileged youth to serving as a business and legal advisor to many companies, large and small, and then being the CEO of a solar energy company which produced enough power to light up over 100,000 homes. Almost my entire career has been spent working with companies, large and small, helping them grow, thrive, and create jobs, while also maintaining a productive and healthy workforce. I will do the same at the Colorado Legislature by asking the tough questions and serving as a leader coming up with creative solutions that benefit all of us. I will work to ensure that our children have an affordable, high-quality, well-funded education. And I will work to make sure that our economy continues to rebound from the recession to ensure that not just us, but our children also have jobs. I have broad support across the political right. spectrum from Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated alike who know that I will represent them with a moderate and fiscally, socially responsible voice at the Capitol. I ask you to join them in voting for me and electing me as your state representative. Thank you so much for coming tonight.
I was going to go out and annoy the general public. I didn't want to do it with something tied around my neck. <laughs> Actually, I was influenced by the story about Jose Mojica, the president of Uruguay, this Saturday in the Denver Post, and he's in favor of legalization, too. So, um, I think he got a, a pretty uh, easy job voting in District 25, because you pretty much close your eyes at, at vote. Um, you've got a uh, competent public official and a loyal member of the Democratic team will help the Democrats when they wish to take us down to Suxley's Brinkley world. And uh, you've got a, 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 a bright young military man who knows how to take orders, which will serve him well in the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got Don Quixote, Granddad, uh, I've run for office uh, seven times, making me the most spectacularly unsuccessful candidate in terms of capitalism. <laughs> and uh, the first time I, you know, the thing about Don Quixote is Don Quixote sees things that other people don't see. In 1994, when I ran around, when I ran for a Democrat uh, for Congress, Congressional District 6, I said, if you let them take away some of your civil liberties to fight the war on drugs, then if God forbid there's ever a real emergency like a terrorist attack, you'll lose all your rights at once. And that's what happened. That's what I guess I've tried to sell you folks. It's like I, I turned off the TV in 1979. I started studying history. I speak two or three foreign languages. I keep up on public affairs, both in my community and in the state and nationwide and worldwide. American politics is toxic right now. It's poisonous and it's poisonous because there's two parties and it's winner take all. You need a moderator in that nuclear core. You need a third party and the Libertarian Party is the third largest party in the United States of America today. Uh, we are not anymore an ideological debating society. We're a serious political party with our own PACs and everything like that. And we are prepared to step into American politics and take on the role of calming down the, vicious, the indescribably vicious nature of American politics today. We don't see much of that in Jefferson County, thank God, but we see a little bit of senatorial races as all the outside money pours in and they call each other names. And I'd like to see America chill out Frankly, I've got grandkids, I've got four grandkids, and I'd like to see America chill out, I'd like to see the Jeff School Board chill out, I would like to see a lot of people who are very excited and have non-negotiable demands in this society chill out a little bit and return to something like the civility and, and attempt to make impartiality that we had in the 20th century. Thank you.
and for the management or the mismanagement and waste of our precious tax dollars. Now you would think that current leadership of the Democratic Party with the recall of two Democrat senators in predominantly Democrat districts and the resignation of the third over the attack against our right to bear arms would listen and seek a balance again. That was our hope. Unfortunately, the next thing on the agenda was Amendment 66, a billion dollar assault on education, jobs, and families that voters thankfully soundly rejected two to one. And the caucus is ready, the Democratic caucus is ready to pursue another radical agenda that we're hearing in 2015, and that's the attack on the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, your ability to basically vote on taxes. It's clear we need to replace politicians who don't trust you with true leaders who actually trust families and business owners to make the decisions that are going to impact their lives instead of central planners. But the only thing out of touch people understand, people in power understand, is grassroots voters and what they do at the polls on election day. I'm asking you for the opportunity to make sure that you have a voice that is going to listen to you. I understand that I work for you. You don't work for me, and I'm not going to forget that. Thank you very much. Hey, 
Good evening. I am uh, Don Roser, your current Jefferson County Commissioner. And as I look out in the audience, it's great to see so many familiar faces. So many individuals that I've had the opportunity to sit down with, to talk with, at their dining room table, down in the county building, up here at the rec center. And it is an indeed honor for me to be here today. I'm a fifth generation Colorado. I was born and raised in Jefferson County. I grew up in Arvada. I went to Jefferson County Public Schools, went to Colorado State University, and I have a degree in civil engineering, and I am a professional civil engineer. I've been married for 25 years to the same wonderful lady who puts up with me. We have three children. And you know, almost four years ago now, I was sworn in as county commissioner. When I was sworn in, we had high unemployment rates in Jefferson County. We had businesses leaving, not only Jefferson County, leaving the state. We had businesses that were closing up. We had our property revenues cut coming into the property tax revenues, we saw a decline of $11.4 million to the county. It was serious time. It took somebody serious to get in there to, to look at what was going on. One of the first items I did was commission an economic development plan, plan for the county. One had never been done before. This economic development plan incorporates the comprehensive plan, it incorporates the open space plan, and it works with our school district. It works with Red Rocks. It works with School of Mines. And you know what? From that economic development plan and from the Forward Jeffco Initiative, we've seen over 3,000 jobs created in the last three years in Jefferson County. We've had floods, we've had fires. I've been up here. I've advocated for you. I've had the privilege of being with Representative Jerome down at the Capitol, advocating for all of you. I've sat at round tables with Lynn Browning. I've sat with Downtown Business Partnership and the Economic Development Group, and I'm working for you. I take this job very seriously. I'm here for you. I'm your representative. I'm here to work. It's proof through performance. When you hear all the candidates talk tonight, look back. Look who was here. Right. Look at the performance. I'm Don Roser at DonaldRoser.com. Thank you.
And our commissioners, for me, and why I somewhat got engaged is because I don't feel that they're engaged with the people. They need to have meetings at night so people can attend. It makes no sense to me that they don't because all the other cities in Jefferson County, they have their council meetings at night. Sure, they need a meeting in the morning as well, but by Colorado Revised Statute, you should have two meetings a week when there's over 100,000 residents. I can provide meetings. As an unaffiliated candidate and as a mediator, I'll be neutral and impartial to your needs. I represent you. Much like a school board, you know, it should be nonpartisan as a commissioner. You know, he should be, he should be nonpartisan. You're out there for the people. And I would hope that if some of the skill sets that I've, I've just now talked about would be something that you endure as a commissioner. Sure, the sheriff's department has some issues, but you know, in the past six months, there's been 30 people resign, 30 sheriffs, sworn sheriffs resign out of 520. That's 5%. You know, and so sheriff's job is a tough job. And you can see that maybe they're, we're on the mend already, but you know, we open up positions for some of our military and some of those things. I know about the issues in Jeffco. Right. Thank you very much. I'm Greg Stanley, and I look forward to the meeting then. Thanks.
This is a fantastic turnout. I think you should give yourselves a round of applause.
that would be off the charts revenue uh, from the sale of, uh, of marijuana. And in fact, uh, those, those projections have all been way off. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, they've uh, way overestimated the amount of tax revenue that has come in as a result of Amendment 64. And there's a couple different reasons for that. One of the reasons is uh, we have medical marijuana that's legal and it's taxed at a much lower rate. Um, and so uh, if there are excess funds that are left over, to me as a father, I, I'm really concerned that um, we're not spending enough time and attention on making sure that our kids are uh, not going to um, be accessing and be able to get a hold of a, of a drug like marijuana. And so I think that would be the appropriate place to, um, if, if we're going to legalize marijuana in Colorado, then, you know, as we have, I think that if there's excess revenue, we need to make sure that we um, can use that for prevention and, and smart regulation to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of our kids. Thanks. I teach uh, in an enrichment program in several public schools. Uh, I teach chess after school, and a lot of the kids are in there. Some of them are in there because they like to play chess, and some of them are in there because their parents can't afford daycare, and they didn't become this kind of problems. And I have 18 kids in one of my class, and I'm a father of four and a grandfather of four, and I can't handle 18 kids at once. How they handle the class sizes nowadays, I have no idea. I've watched it, but it's like watching a professional stage magician. You're not quite sure how it's done. All of a sudden, there's a flurry of activity, and the kids are quiet and learning. So, you know, hey Jeff, go school board, if you want to do something useful to your community, find out where to make borrow or steal some money to reduce the class sizes and drop all the other BS, and uh, yeah, the money should go to the schools because, uh, you know, if we're really a, a society that believes in um, equality of opportunity as opposed to equality of results, there's no magic formula other than bad statistics that can even out all the test scores so all the children are above average, like they like what we got. <laughs> so they should just lower the class size and let the teachers be the crazy little cracks they love to be. And just don't mess with the system. Just make the class sizes smaller, everybody's blood pressure will go down, spend less money on administrative nonsense and all these different programs, all these mandates. They spend all the time coming out paperwork for the federal government at this point. And let the teachers teach the classes and have smaller classes. A lot of my libertarian friends weren't happy with the marijuana tax. I said, there's two things. One would be for the schools. The other thing, if, if we have to pay a tax to the human rights crime, let's pay a tax to the human rights crime. There we go. You know, everything's fine. So I think that, I, in other words, we're, we're, we're all in violent agreement. <laughs> provide 
the options and the variety of programs that are necessary for people to make decisions. There are basically five programs. I was talking to chiropractors the other day and they said, you know that only two of the five programs provide chiropractic care? And that, that's just, that's not variety and we do need to have marketability. I don't think it's a true marketplace right now. How it develops and where it develops, I do believe that we need to take a look at this and uh, if we don't repeal, we need to replace, improve, do whatever we need to do and I want to be part of that in 2015. of the health exchange. For that reason, we thought it was a waste of the taxpayers' money to pay for a sixth audit. Prior to the actual implementation of going live, as we call it, of the health exchange, there were several audits by the federal government to make sure that we were putting this program together correctly. Since its implementation, Colorado is now ranked fifth in the country for being able to drop our number of people who are uninsured in our state. 146,000 people are now insured through the marketplace in private insurance, and uh, almost 200,000 now have access to Medicaid that did not before. So for those of us who want people to have access to health care, uh, particularly people who were uninsured and couldn't get care because of a pre-existing condition or because it wasn't affordable for them, we think that we're heading in the right direction and we think that we need to continue to monitor the work of the exchange, make sure that it stays on track to provide those services. Commissioners need to stand up to that and say that that's not appropriate. 
So it's defined in the master plan, and that's where the work comes in.
to, to try to help pay for college. And, and you know, when I, I, I remember back when uh, I was trying to make my decisions on what I'd be able to do and what my family would be able to help me do to go to college, in-state tuition was a very viable option because it was significantly cheaper uh, than going out of state or going to a private school. Now, unfortunately, um, tuition rates have continued to rise. And so I think what we need to really focus on is making sure that our in-state tuition is affordable so that we can keep our, our talented uh, young men and women that are graduating from high school here in Colorado. We have, we have so many fantastic uh, opportunities for them in terms of higher education, and we have a lot of opportunities in, ter in terms of vocational schools and trade schools as well. So I think that is a, that is a very, very important thing that we need to address as a, as a state and we need to invest not only in K-12 education, but we need to continue to invest in the future uh, for our, our higher ed, uh, so that we can, as I mentioned, take, uh, give the uh, people that graduate from our high schools the opportunity to stay here and, and be part of our uh, growing and, and uh, optimistic future that I think that we do have here in Colorado. So um, I think that that's something that uh, Representative Giroux has, has worked on. I know that's, that's something that uh, we've had a number of representatives that have it's very important affordability. It's very important when it comes to higher ed. And I'm very, very pleased to have been endorsed by Representative Giroux and Representative Rob Wilder and Representative John Miller. Um, and I know that they know that I'm a thoughtful and independent and reasonable uh, young man that's going to uh, be able to, first and foremost, listen and communicate um, with our with our community. So uh, this is a this is a very important issue. There's there's a lot of uh, things that we need to address with respect to education, but higher ed will certainly be a focus.
and universities within Colorado are providing a high quality, cutting edge education, but at an affordable price because these kids are going to be the future leaders of our state. And we need to make sure that not only are they educated, but when they come out, they can find jobs and they don't have to be burdened by such incredibly crushing loads of debt. I know that my sisters and I worked while we were in college, we took out student loans, but they were actually in such an amount that we were able, when we came out of school, to actually pay the monthly amount from our, from our salaries that we had from our jobs. That's not true for these kids anymore. And so it's limiting them in terms of whether they can go into, whether they're going to medical school, whether they can go into primary care, or whether they have to focus on specialties. And we need, as a legislature, to make sure that we actually are keeping higher education affordable. And I'll work to do that at the legislature. Laws 
regulate gun use. If your preference is for minimal regulation, how can we reduce gun violence? If your preference is for more regulation, how do we do that and reconcile it with the Second Amendment rights? Prior to the, to the 2013 legislation, we had gun laws in place in Colorado that required extensive background checks, expense, extensive criminal checks that kept criminals from having guns. Now here's the thing I want you to understand. If a criminal wants to get a gun, is a criminal going to get a gun? That's right, they are. So new laws or more laws or more restrictive laws only restrict one type of people, law-abiding citizens. It never fails. Now when we talk about gun violence, reducing gun violence, the only way to reduce gun violence, basically, is to have more law-abiding citizens. And the only way to make sure, my son, actually both my sons attended Columbine High School. One of my sons, actually Patrick, was there that day. And when you talk, when, when you talk about violence, our family has seen it. And those people at Columbine have seen it. Everybody has a different story. The one thing I can tell you, though, is that if you have a bad person with a gun, you better have a good person with a gun that's ready to stop that person. How many rounds in a magazine do you need to stop intruders? My comment is, as many rounds as it takes. As many rounds as it takes. I am not a believer that any of these gun laws that were passed in 2013 did anything at all to make us safer. All they did was put more burden on law-abiding citizens. And one of the things that Bob Bacon told me one time when we were talking about gun rights, he said, well, Senator, you always talk about law-abiding citizens. And he said, law-abiding is only a temporary condition. That really stuck with me. And I think there are people that believe that us law-abiding citizens are ready to go off the <coughs> at any time. I don't believe that. I trust the people in this room to make the decisions to protect your family, your loved ones, and your, your treasures.
the Stanley Cup. You know, folks, uh, I've been to the budget meeting where um, it's, it's a grim thing. Uh, the employees want raises. And if they're not taking in more money, and the health care costs are 5% they're trying to roll across the employees at the county. At that same meeting, they're projecting out, and this is, this is an ad boy for John, for, for Don, I never thought I'd come up with something like this, but he is working hard on that, and I, I'll give him credit, because credit goes where it's due. The budget looks grim. And it's, it's a fact. In fact, they, they planned it out multiple years, their budget department, and it's grim. Um, they were hoping that the assessor would come in with higher property taxes and then help them out. That's not happening this year. So, you know, with, as far as social services, that group has done an astounding job. They come into that meeting and said, here's what we've done, here's how we cut back some of our labor, and here's what we are doing for the residents of Jeffco. And it's impressive. It's totally impressive. I can't stand up here and, and repeat the same things that Don just said because he's on the mark. And, and, but I believe the same things that he's saying. So, thank you.
maybe it was earlier than that, but it was, they were going to, they said we should cut down some aspen trees to increase the flow of water down the hill so the reservoirs will be fuller as we're drawing water out of them. And it'll be good for the aspen trees too if we thin them out a little bit, they told us. You know. So, I've worked with the oil industry. I've, 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 I've been a computer programmer. I've done inventing control for the oil industry. And a guy who used to work at a company that I was, my company was consulting to, he was a big guy, looked like David Crosby, wore loud Hawaiian shirts. And he just, he'd slap me on the back one day when I was complaining about it. So he said, Jack, he said, the oil company's run by idiots. You gotta understand that. They're all idiots. They all, they were kicking a rock on their land. And, and, and the oil came out of the ground. I don't know if that's really true. But I think that we should have, this. my answer would be, if we really want to stop fracking, if you own a lawnmower, sell it and get a push mower. If you have a motorboat, sell it and get a sailboat. If you have an RV, get a bicycle and a tent. And if fracking is a very expensive way to extract oil, and if the price of oil goes down, fracking will go away. It's that simple. and responsible regulations that are protecting our health, the quality of our water and air, and the amount of water that is being used. Because water is the single most precious commodity in Colorado. I think that the commission that has started to study this issue to come up with recommendations for the legislature, which is comprised of oil and gas experts, environmental experts, scientists who actually know whether there is an impact on our air, on our water quality. That is the way to go because you need to get educated by those experts who really have the facts. And as a legislator, that is part of your duty, to make sure that you are getting the correct information from people who actually know. Every legislator is not an expert on every single issue that comes before the legislature. So it is incumbent upon them to make sure that they are reaching out and getting accurate information. And then taking appropriate steps to enact protections to the extent necessary. It is not a good idea to enact an amendment to our Constitution to deal with something that has changing science, changing uh, issues over the course of many years. Thanks. So when we're talking about fracking, I think it's also important to remember what the current state of the law is in Colorado. And right now we have the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, which promulgates regulations that um, are safety and health related. And, and those are right now are some of the most strict regulations on the oil and gas industry anywhere in the United States when it comes to water quality standards, when it comes to um, uh, setbacks, when it, when it comes to uh, even things like uh, noise mitigation and, and, and things like that. But the, there's a bigger picture here. The, the bigger picture is that um, I, I believe that we need to start pursuing energy independence and security in the United States. And in order to do that, um, we have to take all of the above and all of the below approach to extracting our resources. We have to do that in a safe and responsible manner. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine named Doug. Doug was uh, um, a guy that I served with in Iraq, and, and he was uh, nicknamed the Lion of Fallujah by uh, some newspapers here in the United States, because it was his company that, that took over Fallujah. Um, they went in there in four days, uh, took that out of the hands of Al-Qaeda. And uh, a couple years later, I had, the, I had the privilege of serving with Doug uh, when we were in Iraq. Um, unfortunately, uh, Doug didn't make it home. And 
it was just a couple days before I was supposed to come home, and I got to come off the airplane, and I got to go immediately from the airport right to Arlington to uh, bury my friend. And ladies and gentlemen, if, if we're going to pursue energy independence in a real way, if we're going to pursue energy security in a real, real way in the United States, we've got to recognize we have to come to, uh, to grips with the fact that Iraq is the second largest oil producing nation in the world. Um, we are not going to be able to be energy secure and energy, energy independent unless we safely and smartly extract the resources that we have and continue to allow the technological advancements that are happening in solar and wind to supplement those, um, those uh, natural resources that we have right here in Colorado. Thanks.
But for now, I would, would extend the moratorium until there's overwhelming evidence that the people of Jefferson County want to change. And I don't think that evidence exists. Thank you. This is not an easy discussion. This is not an easy decision. I have three children. Friends of mine have children, and we want to keep marijuana out of the hands of children. No matter what side you're on, marijuana, whether you're pro-marijuana or anti-marijuana, it's keeping it out of the hands of children. But it goes much further than retail sales. There's edibles. There are grow operations, there are clubs, there are testing facilities, there are setbacks, there are zoning codes. It's not easy. To do, if it was determined to implement retail sales, it takes, you demand a good job from the county commissioners. Amendment 64 said, hey, county commissioners, using your staff, we expect you to make the right decisions, to look into it, to make sure that we represent all of you in this room. And when we talk about sales tax revenue, let's think about that. The county cannot assess a sales tax on individual items. There will be zero county retail sales tax. There's excise tax coming from the state, of about one half of one percent, where it's all said and done after everybody gets their piece. Legislation would have to change at a state level to allow counties to assess taxes like cities and to move forward. If we don't opt in, we don't get the excise dollars. The schools still get the money. The counties do not get excise dollars for rehab, rehabilit for for drug abuse awareness or for law enforcement. It's not an easy decision. It's one I take very seriously. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the regular debate part of our program, but I'm gonna guess that a few audience members might ask the questions. We only have one microphone and it is attached to a cord. So the way we're gonna do this is, uh, Lynn is gonna stand over here I'd like those of you with questions to line up in front of her, and she's going to let you have the microphone. I would just ask that the audience questions stay within the bounds of civility that we all our candidates have shown tonight. And if you want to ask an ambush question, don't, because I'm going to buzz you and say no. So come on down here if you'd like to ask a question. <laughs> Quite a bit has been said tonight about education, and I have one question for the three folks in the room, I guess, or whoever else would like to address it. Um, you know, I keep hearing about funding for college education, about Moving high school education so kids do better in college. Now, I'm not against that. Between myself, my wife, and our son, we've got eight degrees. So, college was a big thing for us. But when I was in high school way back in the dark ages, in addition to college prep, we had vocational education courses, things for people that were going to auto mechanics, or farming, or, you know, where they had accounting courses, things like that. And I don't see that anymore. To me, there's a big place for those, and I'd like to hear comments on that. Anybody want to respond? Not a problem. I think we've done a disservice to our kids. You know, we've talked about everybody being college ready and a four year college degree. I don't think that's 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 the uh, plan for everyone. And uh, you know, there have been people. There's a gentleman that uh, actually put a hundred thousand dollars up for a student and said, uh, "If you don't go to college and you start your own business, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars because you won't have the debt." 
Um, so there are a lot of different things out there. There are going to be a lot of different options. But one size fits all never works for anything. Hopefully we should learn that. And it, it's definitely with that with higher education, too. The other thing it does is it creates, I think it actually creates a situation where if everybody has a college degree, where is the exceptionalism there? But the other thing that's really important is kids need to learn how to work. And we've done so many things policy-wise to avoid that or to, to basically uh, disenfranchise them with those opportunities. Uh, getting a job, being in high school and having a job is extremely important. If you don't have enough money to go to college after you're in high school, what's the problem with working for a year and getting some money so that you're not filing up on debt? When I heard about the, when the comment, I think, uh, uh, Jan, I think you mentioned about the, uh, the teacher that uh, had $165,000 in debt. I'm sorry, where were her parents to say, wait a second, what's your plan here? You know, we've got to do some things that are actually not part of government to try to put some common sense back. But vocational, technical degrees, um, uh, certificate programs, those should be all the above that we're looking at. We need to make sure that we bury our focus. I absolutely agree um, with the gentleman who asked the question and um, uh, Tim Neville that um, we do need a whole range of opportunities in terms of education for our children. Um, that they don't all necessarily want to go to a four-year college and um, that there are plenty of other opportunities that we need them to explore and that all of us benefit from. My um, father-in-law was the principal at West High School when I was growing up in Denver and he had a special automotive program for the high school students. Um, there was a welding um, class, and um, there were several other kinds of classes like carpentry for the students. So when they left the high school, they had those skills that were marketable, and they could move forward and use those um, to support themselves in their careers for the rest of their lives if they chose, or to use as a way of helping pay for them to go to college and um, study some other subject area as well. So I think that this is um, a part of our education system that is often overlooked. I wonder if our high school counselors are being expected to promote um, college as the most appropriate decision for every student when um, we're not promoting the idea that there are lots of opportunities for our students and they should look at those based on what their interests are um, as students rather than us saying, well, 50% of all the kids who graduated from our high schools all went on to college and somehow that's uh, a mark of success. I think a mark of success is that our students are doing the work that they enjoy and well prepared. Thank you, Lynn. Sorry, Jim. No Jump problem. in there. Very relevant question, and I love it. Three years ago, I was meeting with uh, a multitude of business owners in Jefferson County, from small three-person firms all the way up to the Lockheed Martins, the Miller Coors of the world. And they told them, I asked them, I said, what is your biggest hurdle that you see tomorrow, in a month, three years, five years? And they said, trades. We don't have the mechanics. We do not have the machinists. We do not have the welders. I worked with, come here, Lynn. I worked with, going off script, I worked with our chambers of commerce. I worked with Red Rocks Community College, with our school district. And we have the Jefferson County Business Education Alliance. And what that does, and Lynn serves on that board, and what that does is matches up. It works with counselors. It works with students. And it gets those students out to get them into their passion. And you know what it does? It matches them up with a mentor. That mentor in business, and in some cases, they may be juniors and seniors, they have summer jobs. And they're guaranteed a job when they graduate from high school. 
and it's there, and they're trained, and they move right in, and they're productive. We realize that in Jefferson County, we're working with, with our workforce department, and we're keying in with Red Rocks, with the school district, and best of all, with the businesses, and we're providing those students with the mentors where they may not have that. Thank you. She's at Rappel Community College. She's working her way through college. That's what she's doing. Her boyfriend is learning how to, to weld. So those things are going on. Uh, I, I'm not sure where people get the impression. During the recession, the uh, enrollment in those community college, colleges soared. So those things are going on right now in Colorado. And it's not as bad as it sounds. Yeah. Here I didn't want to be first, and now I'm jumping all over to get up here and speak. Um, First of all, I, I will tell you that I benefited from those programs when I was in high school because not only did I go to the woodworking class and made my own dresser, but I learned how to sew and I made all of my clothes through high school. We also have, our son has been working every summer since he got into high school because we felt that it was important that he learn that the importance of a dollar. And so he is actually helping to pay for his education. But the one thing that I wanted to say about these programs, there needs to be more Warren Techs. Warren Techs, Warren Tech provides an incredible opportunity for kids to actually take classes in the regular high school and go for a half day to Warren Tech, learning all sorts of different things. And we need to make sure that if we don't have more Warren Techs, then we are putting those trades back into the schools, which is where they were when I went to high school. And yes, I know some people might say it was the dark ages, but we actually had all of those right there in our high school, from welding to auto mechanics, to woodworking, to home ec, and that's where they should be, which is why we need to have increased funding for our schools. Thanks. See, now this is where having Don Quixote in the State House would really help, because Don Quixote sees things that the others don't see. Yeah. I'm all for that. I, 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 I think the low tech idea is great. It was great when America had huge uh, manufacturing industrial base, especially like when I was young. I could temporarily drop out of high school, just run down to the local factory and get a job being paid like a grown man. I was 16 and a half at the time. But what's coming next, I don't know if they're going to teach at the low tech, because what's coming next is a huge new wave of automation. And I do not know what they're going to teach the kids. The automation, the, auto, the robots are going to be cooking your burgers. They're going to be repairing your car. They're going to be building the streets. They're going to be driving your car. The robots are coming. We're finally starting to catch up to the gen. I guess they got a bit ahead of us on that. I, I'm not sure that we know right now what the educational skills that the um, non, uh, you know, white collar worker, what the blue collar worker of the future is going to be. I think we, we have to think about that very seriously and perhaps redesign our whole education system and not just the crumbling division between degree education and blue collar education. We have to think about it in light of a new way of automation that's going to sweep over us for the next 10 to 20 years. <laughs>
I built the house from the foundation up. I worked on my own vehicles. And I passed those traits to my son. Now, to my sons, both of them. And the thing is about that is you can see everything on YouTube. And you look at how home improvement is going nowadays and Home Depot and the videos and then how to do things. Who can afford to not do it themselves and not often? So I'm saying that, you know, we're seeing technology kind of change the way things are going. And I think that it's incumbent upon parents and, and kids to encourage them to use every means possible to learn to do it on their own. The problem is we still need the credentials to get the jobs. So how do we fix that? So I'm for more education in this. Thank you. Okay, hey, next question from the audience.
I believe, I believe one with Plutarch, the character is fate. Uh, I've done this seven times. This is my seventh campaign. I haven't gotten elected like yet. You know I'm doing this because I want to do it, not because anybody's pushing me to do it. And so I guess if I get into office, I will do whatever seems best for me in my community at the time. And if my constituents want to yell at me afterwards, I'm very glib and I'll probably be able to talk them down. <laughs>
or you'll sell your soul. So that's stayed with me as an elected official, as a former county commissioner, and now as a senator. It is very important to me that I never violate my own principles. But I also think it's very important that you know what I stand for. So that when you decide to support me to be in this office, you can tell whether your values line up with mine, whether your position on issues line up with mine. And that's why I am very transparent about the positions I take. They're all on my website. And if there's one that I'm missing, you can always ask me. I'd be glad to share it with you. So, but first I vote my conscience, and then I vote my district. Thank you. This is the point where I say Don Richard. Um, I think we've heard it multiple times here. Principles, conscious. I'm there too. I I vote my my morals. I look at my district, and my district is all of Jefferson County, not just District 3. It's all of those who voted for me, and all those who voted against me, and all those who skipped over. When we look at dollars coming in and funding, I have wonderful, wonderful supporters. I have so many friends and family, and they know my background. They know my my integrity. Can they get overzealous sometimes? We none of you have any relatives that just get a little too energetic at, at events, right? Yeah. But it's great. I love having those supporters, those individuals who believe so much in me to support me with their hard earned dollars for another campaign so that I can represent all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great question. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen Mill. I'm from Morrison, Colorado. I am one of those parents that did pay for their college education of three sons. So, I don't know what happened. Their kids' education. I felt it was my duty, but my sons now tell me, no, Mom, we, we're not going to be able to do that. So I'm very disappointed. But this is my question, and if it's okay, I would like to direct it, direct it to the candidates for the House of Representatives and the Senate. And my concern has to do with illegals coming into Colorado, how it affects voter voting, how it affects uh, jobs, how it affects them being able to get benefits and things like that. Would you mind addressing that, please, for me? Thank you. Thank you. House Representatives, anybody want to respond to that? Yeah, come on up. The position of the Libertarian Party is that the borders of the United States, and as far as is constant with national security, should be open. That is our party. That is our party position. And I want you to understand that while I think party platforms in general are written by the people that they have to send off in a room somewhere and give them something to do so they don't disrupt the party business, that that happens to be one part of the libertarian uh, program that I entirely support. No sooner than I know I see the and the uh, immigrants are coming to this country driven as leaves before the economic winds of the transnational economy and because their land has been devastated by the war on drugs that we forced upon them. For, to extend that a little further, I think that this, a lot of the problems in America could be solved by North American Union. I think we've been screwing Mexico long enough. It's about time to get married. <laughs> As someone who served um, served our country, I have a national uh, 
privacy and national security clearance and, and now as a reservist uh, assigned to headquarters of the United States Southern Command. So I definitely do understand that there is a threat at our border <coughs> and I think we need to be very mindful of that. I think we're, we're not addressing that adequately right now. But I want to also um, say that any intellectually honest answer about immigration requires that we really look at the fact that it's our system that's broken. It's our, it's our immigration system. We need to put pressure on our, our leaders in the federal government, since immigration is a federal issue, to first and foremost fix that system. So um, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm a compassionate guy. I, I understand why people would want to come to the United States. Of course I do. As a father, I want, I want the best for my family. Um, but we, we absolutely have to be able to point the finger at the right person. And right now, our immigration policy is failed in the United States. There is no doubt that we need comprehensive immigration reform on so many levels, but we can't penalize those children who were brought here unwittingly, unknowingly. They were young children when they came here, and they were brought here by their parents. So we need to help them, for sure. The other thing that I would say on this topic is that many of these kids that we have been reading about recently, who have been flooding our borders, are not necessarily coming for the economic American dream. They are fleeing the violence the drug violence, and the abuse that they're receiving in their own countries. And somehow, we need to address those issues in order to help these people want to stay in their country. Because they don't necessarily want to come here. They just want to be safe. And we need to make sure that we are trying to help them in that respect. But overall, we need comprehensive immigration reform. And that includes enforcing the laws that we currently have. Thanks. Dad, I'll have to disagree with you on that. Comprehensive immigration reform doesn't mean that when we talk about enforcing laws that are already in the books, it's just about enforcing the laws that are already on the books. We need to have the will to do that. The question is, when we have leadership at any level, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a leadership issue. This is a failure of leadership at the federal level. We also have some challenges at the state level. We need to understand at the state level that we have the opportunity to either be a magnet for future immigration or, a mag or not a magnet. When I say immigration, Understand that we have a country that opens itself up to people that want to be here more than any other country in the world. We have over 1.1 million legal immigrants come into this country every year. Let's not forget about that in this debate. Is it fair to allow illegal immigration when legal immigrants are waiting and doing everything they should do to come here legally? I don't think it is. We also have a situation where, like we see so many things, it doesn't matter whether it's our, our national forest or whatever else, but the federal government is not providing the stewardship it needs to. And we pay in the state of Colorado. When those kids come in there, and we all have heartfelt stories about those kids we see at the border, when they come in there, they come into Colorado, they're going to end in Jefferson County Public Schools. And all of you are going to be wondering, why do we need more dollars? Why do we need more money? Well, we need to take a look at this. One of the things that I can tell you as a state legislator, I believe in the Tenth Amendment, and I believe in having state legislatures that stand up and make sure that we hold our federal legislators, Democrat or Republican, accountable for doing their job. They have not been doing their job. Like many of my colleagues, I agree at the national level we do need immigration reform. Um, we have not um, been able to accomplish that at the national level. 
I also have had a numerous conversations in my role as your state senator with our national leaders, our congressional delegation from Colorado about this issue and the message has always been, you need to get to work, we do need to reform our immigration laws. At the state level, primarily our responsibilities are not focused on immigration. One of the opportunities that we've had in the last four years was to pass the asset bill. And that bill was to allow the children who came to this country illegally, when they were babies, didn't know that they were being brought here because they were just babies, uh, to that have gone all the way through our education system, our high school system, to allow them to pay the same in-state tuition rate for going to our colleges in a way that does not exclude our own local children's opportunity to be in those colleges as well. But there are very few opportunities actually that we have other than the influence at the national level of our congressional bill. questions. We are scheduled to go to lines. So if there are other questions, please let us know by lining up here on the site. Hi, my name is Kit Darrell, and I wanted to start by thanking all of you for running for an elected office. I too have run for an elected office. It's a lot of hard work. I don't care what party you're from or if you're not from any party. <laughs> um, it's a lot of hard work and it's exhilarating exhausting and all of those things. So um, thank you to all of you. Um, my question is very general in nature. Given the complexity of the issues that we face, even at the local level, they're growing in, in complexity. They're not getting easier. Given the complexity of the issues that we face at the local levels, how do I know that you are listening to me? Great question. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> Jack. As the leading existentialist on the panel tonight, I'll take to answer that. I think that I hear all sorts of different partisan approaches to all sorts of problems, and every time I end up cornering someone who disagrees with me completely on every issue, and getting alone, we find usually we're looking at the same things, we're just drawing different conclusions from the same thing. So what what politicians do is they try to be like you know psychic receptive receptive antennas. When politicians appear to be lying, what they're really trying to do is keep a narration that coincides with everything they've heard and blend it all together and they say. You know, people don't want gray, so it can't, you know, if it's black and white, they come up with gray. And that's, that's when you think your politicians are lying to you, unless they're stealing, that's a different case entirely. So, I, I think that, that when, you, when you ask a question, when, uh, when this gentleman asked about Votech, uh, when, when the gentleman asked about character, when someone asked about immigration, we know from their questions what they believe. We can hear it. Listening, we're constantly trying to trim our sails to, to the prevailing winds because that is, you know, leadership, Winston Churchill said, is finding where the people are going and getting their five minutes ahead of them. So I think, I think we're always listening. You will know that I am listening to you because I have an open door policy. I've been sitting here for the last seven years just across the street, listening to all of you and all of your concerns that you have had and brought to the Evergreen Park and Recreation District Board. I have been out there asking you to come and tell us what's on your mind, what you want, and I will continue to do that as your state legislature, legislator. All you have to do is call, come by my home, which is right around the corner, or send me an email. And you know that I will be listening to you and I'll be responding to you. Thank you. Thank you.
and thank you for your question there. And actually, you'll know that I'm responsive to you uh, because, you know, I'm, uh, I just looked it up on my phone. On uh, May 8th, you sent me an email and asked me some questions about my campaign, and I emailed you back that day. And so I think that words have meanings, and I'm, I'm running to be a representative. And I want, I want everyone to know that uh, I, I believe that being a representative means that you're willing to listen and that you're willing to communicate. Thanks. There are many ways that you can communicate with me, and I will respond. Those include calling me at my home, and many of uh, the my citizens' constituents who live in the district were surprised that on my literature, on my business card, on um, my website, is my home phone number. And people often will call me at home in order to tell me their story, their concern, and let me know a problem they're dealing with, um, hoping that there'll be some way that I can help them with whatever their issue is. Maybe it's a personal issue, maybe it is um, a bill that they would like me to carry to address an issue that's more broadly uh, cast as a concern, not just for them as an individual. But the point of all that is to say, um, the way I listen to people is to make sure that it's easy for them to be able to reach me by either calling me at home, calling me on my cell phone, calling me at the Capitol, um, emailing me, writing me a personal letter, um, asking me to visit with them about an issue at the town hall meetings that I hold on a regular basis, and then you'll know that I'm listening to you because I have this mechanism that makes it easy for you to communicate with me, and you'll know that I'm listening to you because I always respond. We all have cell phones, we all have email, 
through Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts. There's a difference between listening and understanding, listening and hearing. And where it gets difficult sometimes for elected officials, for all of us, is when we hear what you're saying, when we may understand what you're saying, but at the same time we may agree to disagree. And it's how that communication occurs. Is it professional? Is it honest? Is it sincere? Because if we can articulate as an elected official our position, even though it may differ from yours or be the same, then that means we truly did hear and understand your concern. Thank you. What's my name? Uh, hey, uh, you know, I'm a mediator. And, I, and it's, just, it's a, a task that you have to be a good listener. You have to hear people. But more importantly, you have to respond to the problems that are happening and respond to their issues and try to meet, have them meet in the middle. The thing with being responsive, you know, I. If you want something bad enough, you get out and do it. To, to run for commissioner wasn't an easy thing. I had to get out and canvas and gather signatures. I gathered a lot of signatures here at the farmer's market in Evergreen, and in Golden, and all over. And I, and I made it. I mean, you need to send 150, I gave them 1111. And I talked to so many people, listened to so many people see what's going on. I've been to every county meeting. Since early November, the board of county commissioners hearing me, the ones at 8 o'clock. And you, don't, you know what? You get three minutes to spill out your issues at the county. Three minutes, and that's it. You're cut off. I'm cut off in one. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue that's huge. Yeah. we got to have meetings at night like all the other councils. That's, I mean, if you're going to stand up here and say, hey, you know, I'm listening, well, come on. Let's make it convenient to hear the people that elect you, and let's model the jobs. Let's let's model being the representative for you. Okay. Thanks. I'm Bruce Short. So here's what we're going to do. Responses will now be limited to 30 seconds. Go. <laughs> I was going to give you one. I like that. All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Sanderson. I'm a member of It's great to see so many great candidates out um, for this year's election. Uh, my question is, uh, while Jeffco has largely avoided the negative experience that was released of it to these, uh, in Colorado and across the nation, um, these events undermine uh, and trust in law enforcement here and everywhere. Uh, what do you see as your role in um, kind of mitigating those negative effects and preventing them from coming here to Jeffco? Our sheriff's department doesn't have the standards like some of the sheriff's departments around the metro area. They are well trained, they're excellent, and the turnover in the sheriff's department has to stop. Thank you. When, when we look at the departments that we have in Jefferson County, we are very blessed. We have some great subject matter experts, from all of our elected officials to our department directors. And it's key that we all work together, whether it is working with the sheriff, working with human services to, to help eliminate any of these threats that are out there, and to help that we all, to, to make sure that we communicate together and coordinate when we see one department or one agency going in, in, in the wrong direction, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was cut off. I think, we, I think we're very lucky. We have very good professional law enforcement. Uh, and I think that's partly because we just want a place to live. The Libertarian Party is particularly concerned about the militarization discuss it quite a bit without wishing to disagree with anything I heard before and just having 30 seconds to add that point that the, the Libertarian candidate is the one most likely to resist further militarization of civilian law enforcement. You know you have bad apples everywhere. You're going to have them 
occasionally in the sheriff's department. And the thing is, is what are you going to do to resolve that? Well, I know for a fact, and, and at least a few years ago, that the sheriff's department had a public affairs person that took those complaints seriously and tried to mitigate them. You need better oversight over the planning and zoning committee and the, the department here for similar things because you have bad apples everywhere, everywhere in, in corporations and in, in, in places that you need to uphold standards and the people in charge and the leadership need to stick to those standards. Zero base tolerance and, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Too concerned about the uh, militarization of many of our police departments across the country. I'm also concerned about some of the search and shoot seizure uh, policies that are in, in parts of the country that we see where people are coming in and having property confiscated. As Coloradans, now that we move outside of the state of Colorado, we may be on vacation, we have those nice green license plates, and all of a sudden we may become targets in other states. Now, here's what I can say about Jefferson County we have, unfortunately, we have good leadership. That's where it starts. The other thing is as citizens, we can trust, but we better verify. We better verify. And I think I see Jeff Schrader back there. He would probably agree. Colorado is a local control state, and I'm a former county commissioner. So I feel strongly that this is really a good question for our county commissioner candidates and the role that the uh, state senate should play really has to do with making sure that we have laws that are passed that are reasonable for the uh, law enforcement at the local level to uh, carry out and enforce. Um, but we don't have a strong role and probably shouldn't. I'm the chair of the local government committee for the state senate and I think the reason that I was asked to chair was so we could respect those local control issues. Okay, next question. Okay, next question. I'm afraid of this thing. Oh, it's on. Gary Justice, four years in Evergreen, a refugee from Chicago. <laughs> My question concerns the topic that's on television all the time in these ads, and yet no one has touched upon abortion and access to birth control. And it's important because we have a new version of the personhood amendment uh, on the ballot in Colorado. And also because across state legislatures, we're seeing lots of uh, initiatives to restrict access uh, to abortion. So my question is, for the state candidates, what reasonable restrictions should be placed upon access to certain forms of birth control and abortion? Quick and easy, yes or no, or something else. Thank you for the question. Let's start with uh, Jack and then I, I think the quick access to the executive summary of your answer is the restrictions necessary to do with everyone's health position of the Libertarian Party is whoever makes these life and death decisions, it shouldn't be the government. I believe reproductive health choices are personal decisions and should be made by the individuals who are making those decisions and that the government should not make those decisions for them.
Code Amendment. It goes way too far. It should be a women's right to choose. We shouldn't still be fighting this issue after 41 years. And I can tell you that that amendment would criminalize some of the things that I have personally experienced. From miscarriage to in vitro fertilization and tubal pregnancies. And there is no person, no government, who should be telling me that the horrible things that I went through should be criminalized. They are available, so if you do have further questions about their positions, do reach out to them. Okay, with your question, please. My name is Chris. I've lived in Genesee for 33 years. I'd like to know your positions on gay marriage. All of us should have the same rights. That's my position. Please read your Canyon Courier. <laughs> <laughs> 